The United Arab Emirates. A desert between mountains and sea. Wealth where there was once only sand. Skyscrapers where Bedouin tents once stood. Motorways where a hundred years ago caravans passed. Everything is different today. Almost everything. The falcon is still present. He helped the Bedouins survive in the desert. The falcon was their hunting weapon. The chances of this infection coming back, 100% almost. The falcon is the cause of great worry indeed. I think the timing was just right. If he left him any longer, he'd dehydrated in the show. Today, he's a reminder of former generations when this tamed bird of prey was still at the center of every clan. It's daybreak, and the blazing heat of the sun is already smothering the land. It's turning summer in the United Arab Emirates, and soon the heat will be unbearable. Every year at this time, Humaid Obaid al-Muhayri Private Secretary to Sheikh Hamdan has a very special duty. He is to grant three falcons their freedom, a ritual conducted as the falcon season draws to a close. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum, Ismail. Are the others not here yet? Where's my father? They wanted to come shortly before sundown. The freeing of the falcons is a celebration. There is pita bread kneaded in sugar and camel's milk just as it was a thousand years ago. Only the caravans of yore are missing, since modern-day Bedouins prefer jeeps. <laughs> Humaid's assistants, Ali and Mohammed, have brought the birds. Granting them their freedom is a gift to Mother Nature and to Allah. Sheikh Hamdan has chosen the falcons himself from his flight of more than 200 birds. They're not his very best, but each is worth over $5,000 nonetheless. Peanuts for the Sheikh, who is himself abroad at the moment. Private secretary who made is responsible for the Sheikh's falcons. This uh, falcon is uh, what we released now is uh, being fed last night, late last night. So he's not really interested in the chase and um, he's not trained very very well. You see, if you saw him when he's flying, he wasn't. Uh... Yet, uh? The third falcon makes one more pass over the jeeps, and then he too bids adieu to mankind forever. After sundown, it's high time for evening prayers towards Mecca. Humaid's father reminisces at the campfire about the old days. I too once had a falcon. I have to tell you about it. It was my favorite bird. He was the strongest and most handsome falcon in the entire region. He was with me for seven years. And on the day I had planned to free him, he refused to fly off. He didn't want to leave me. I tried every day and then he flew away. There is a poem writer, he's a Prince Khalid al-Faisal, where he described his imagination like a falcon, where, he, you know, you can't hold a, a, how to, you know, how the mind imagine things. So he uh, described his imagination as a falcon, went up, you can't call it back. You imagine, when you imagine things, you, you, you fly with your imagination. 
it's not like you are a human being walking on the, on the, so he described his imagination like a falcon flying with the sky and watching down and looking. They never call a falcon a name, which is a disappointing name. They always call their falcons a names after heroes. So the falcon is something very, very, very special. And the relation is, it's, it's very, uh, can't be described by words. <laughs> My story isn't over yet. L let me finish. Sometime later, a friend was driving in my Jeep. What happened? My falcon flew to him. He thought it was me in the car. <laughs> Dubai, the Manhattan of the Orient. Melting pot of tradition and modernity. A hub between East and West. Falcons are still at the center of society here. The symbol of this proud bird of prey is omnipresent. Experts from Europe and the United States work here in elaborate and costly breeding stations and in the Royal Falcon Hospital. Rush hour on the Sheikh Zayed Highway. Veterinarian Dr. David Rempel is on his way to work. His speciality, falcons. When I was a young boy, I lived in this city where there was only one falconer. Uh, this old man and I saw him walking around with a falcon on his hand and ever since that point then I always uh, was fascinated with falcons. I can't describe what it was that turned on this switch but this is something with all falconers I think they see something when they're in their childhood and they become fascinated from that point on. Rempel was commissioned by Sheikh Hamdan bin Rashid Al Maktoum to open the world's first falcon hospital exclusively for birds belonging to the sheikh, his princes, uncles, friends, and cousins. The family is enormous. David Rempel and his team treat 3,000 falcons a year in the Royal Falcon Hospital. Work starts at 8 a.m. The first patient is already in the waiting room. One of the sheikh's friends brings in his Seika falcon. The bird isn't feeling well. Consuming water. Okay, let's take him back and take a quick check. I'll bring him back in just a, a few minutes, okay? It's got a complaint that it's vomiting right now and uh, possibly losing a little weight, so we'll see. Standard routine in the treatment room. Visual and manual checkups and laboratory tests. The normal procedure. But first... The fecal for you. The stool sample. Assistant Ahmed will search for conspicuous features. Most ailments can be traced back to the claws. This bird is, uh, right now, um, we're just interested in looking at the feet, but the feet look pretty good on the bird. There's nothing wrong with the bottoms of the feet. He does have a little bit of a blister here on his toe. Which, uh, could be a beginning pox lesion, but that's, I don't think that's anything to be concerned about. Rempel has to take a swab from the bird's gullet. The stool sample was positive. Ahmed has discovered a, a parasite, an intestinal parasite. So that's most likely what's causing this problem. A Siberian Jafalcon is still in the ward. It was delivered yesterday evening with suspected Newcastle disease. Contagious like a cold, but deadly. A typical falcon illness. Cheryl Rempel, the doctor's wife, is responsible for the laboratory tests. We're going to be looking at a CBC, which is a complete blood count. We look for infection, we look for any abnormalities of blood samples. We are looking at the difference between the different kinds of blood cells. We'll send it over for biochemistries. And we can get a lot of information from a very little bit of blood. Newcastle disease has wiped out entire poultry farms in the Emirates. We do exactly, this is like if you go into the hospital for your own blood work, do the same thing. We do fasting, blood sugars, we do it just like it was a human. The greatest care is called for. I think he can go back now. Do we have a fecal from yesterday? Yeah. Okay. Next door, the microscope reveals the culprit. It's eaten some food where it's obtained an intestinal parasite. We see this commonly, and it's very easy to treat this. No. Sample is negative. 
He wasn't able to see the tiny one-celled parasite, but Rempel is completely certain of the diagnosis, coccidia. So it's a one-dose medication. Lusa? Okay. Easy problem. Coccidia. Coccidia. Okay. We gave him medicine today. This is for next week. Okay. One week, oh. give him this one. Okay. In, in seven days, give him this one. Okay. okay. Thank you. Bring the bird back in two weeks, says Rempel. Then everything should be okay. As long ago as the 15th century, falcon breeders and dealers came here from Europe. The invention of the gun, though, meant a sudden end to the falcon's importance in the north. But not on the Arabian Gulf. Mohammed Hilal is a businessman. With the profits from his real estate business, he's now building a falcon breeding station. His favorite falcon accompanies him wherever he goes. This is uh, called Mansour. Actually, this one is uh, especially for uh, Karawan, which is, they call it, I think, uh, Stone Kerlo, something like that. I'm not sure about the name. Uh, this is very fast. This is actually Indian one, Indian type uh, bird. Not, not, uh, uh, not emigrate from India, actually stay there in the uh, India area. Uh, one is uh, Kuleb, one is a Dheep. There's the other two, uh, which is, uh, I have uh, Jir Shaheen. But this one is a little bit smaller because uh, good for the maneuvering, climbing very fast, turning very fast. Mohammed is out with friends again today to relax and unwind from the constant stress. No, this is all, all, all family. Family and some of them friends. They came some from Abu Dhabi and uh, from my local area. It's nice. Every, every day we are meet here just for training and if you got something new in the training and these things, always coming. And everyone giving, giving us his uh, opinion about his beard and what uh, we have to do for next time. Very nice, like you see this, this one. Laid back oriental ways are a thing of the past in the Emirates. Time is money, just like everywhere else. But falcons still have their place in the daily routine of the men who spend their afternoons out flying them for relaxation. The Arabs have their own training methods for falcons. They're not interested in high altitude flight and steep nose dives. They love maneuverability and speed. They want to condition their birds for the duel on the ground. That, they say, is what makes things entertaining and exciting. The training method with bait and string is centuries old. For the old Bedouins, having a fit falcon was vital. A well-trained bird of prey could feed several families. The reward? as much quail as they can eat. For the falcon, the effort was well worth it. It's a lesson he'll remember. That's the only way to train a falcon. Falcons are proud birds. The owner will achieve nothing with humiliation or punishment. Only loving attention and reward can turn a raptor into an obedient bird, a truth that the Bedouin's great-grandfathers were aware of. At the beginning, we have to stay with the bird a long time to be friend. At least uh, 10 days at the beginning. And give him food a little bit. When the bird is becoming jumping towards you and uh, becoming friend, you start to release them and call them for, for a lure and, or, or for anything which is you want to, to train on. Sudden excitement. Someone has sighted a duck somewhere behind the bushes. Hunting fever breaks out. A falcon is readied for action in a flash. In the old days, they rode out here on camels. Hunting was an essential part of life. Today, it's a way of passing the time, a gentleman's sport, as falconers say, all over the world. For just a moment, man becomes the master of ceremonies of an archaic natural spectacle, the deadly, merciless hunt, the predator pursuing its victim, and man determines the time and place of this everyday drama. The laws of nature obey him, even if it's only for a moment.
Dubai, a boom town between tradition and modernity. Three quarters of the population are foreigners. Pakistanis, Indians. They drive taxis and build roads and houses. From Europe and North America come highly paid experts for architecture, tourism, the internet and the folk. When I was a young boy, I've always been interested in birds and wildlife. And I went to a game fair, which is a sort of country show for hunting and fishing. And I saw some falcons there. Some people were giving a display of falconry. And as soon as I saw them, I, I knew immediately that's what I wanted to do. And ever since then, I've always had falcons and loved them. Englishman David Le Mesurier is very worried. His $20,000 breeding falcon is seriously ill. He's only just bought the bird for the breeding center that he's building on the outskirts of Dubai. What a stroke of bad luck. The bird is listless. It staggers and refuses to fly. Clearly a case for the Royal Falcon Hospital. If there's anyone who can help, it's David Rempel. Of course, she's got some food in her, too. So she's getting a little stinky. Rempel finds nothing external. The doctor decides to perform an endoscopy. He wants to look at the bird's lungs and air sacs. Anxious moments for David Le Mesurier. His bird might have aspergillosis, the much feared falcon tuberculosis. Aspergillosis spores lie dormant in every bird, like the herpes virus in humans. Stress or physical exhaustion causes the illness to break out. The aspergillosis then spreads through the lung like mold. Well, we don't know. We know that it's got some infection going on inside. So we're going to take a look. Birds are filled with air, which makes it real easy to uh, endoscope them. We can go in on many different sites, and we have a nice air-filled cavity to look at. Operation under general anesthetic. Everything just like with human beings, only smaller and more expensive. Just how expensive, no one knows. Treatment in the Royal Falcon Hospital is free of charge. Once a year, a large check arrives from the Sheikh. It covers everything. Rempel puts an extra tube in place. You never know. Okay, they wake up very quickly, so we're going to keep them down. Why do you use the tracheal tube as opposed to the mask? It gives us more of, a, of an emergency ready system in case the bird stops breathing. That way we can always bag them and, and forcefully ventilate them. When they're breathing on their own with a cone, you have no control over anything except the amount of... You know, so this way you can actually force it in? Yeah. Are you going no, to the air sacs here? Yeah. David okay. bought the Siberian Jafalcon from a traveling trader without papers or certificates. Number of previous owners unknown, a risk. But Davis was enraptured, a handsome bird, a female, just what he needed for breeding. I see a fairly normal body cavity. Was this bird ever treated for lungworms, David? Not as far as I'm aware. Okay. Threw one of the air sacs into the other cavity, which means that this bird may have been scoped before by somebody else, but I don't think so. We've been seeing a suture in there. We're trying to find out what the infection is. Um, my main concern is obviously primarily for, for this bird, but also for my other breeding stock. If it's got something which is contagious and can go through the breeding center, then it's obviously a big problem. So it's very important we find out what this bird has. So if it is something contagious, we can contain it as soon as possible. There's nothing abnormal in this bird at, the, at this point. Um, we've taken some blood samples before, which is slightly abnormal, which is why we're doing the scoping now on this one. But the actual scoping, we expected to see some things in there which we're not seeing at this point. But maybe on the other side, yeah. when we scope on that side, we may pick up something there. Okay. Let's go on the other side and take a look. The falcon seems to have been having problems for quite some time. The atmosphere in the hospital is tense. Rempel can't stop wondering whether David Le Mesurier's falcon might have aspergillosis. It's got all the symptoms. But he hasn't yet found anything concrete. Just a little bit of an antibiotic to sweeten up her stomach a little bit. Okay. Falconers live in fear of aspergillosis, but Rempel keeps his cool. As long as he's not certain, there's not much he can do. Just in case, he has the bird put in quarantine. Anyway, we'll just put watch it.
The chances that the Falcon will recover, says the doctor, are 50-50. He can't make any promises. He's been in this business long enough to know better. David Rempel has to keep the bird in hospital, in the isolation ward, for a minimum of three weeks at a maximum of 15 degrees Celsius. Outside, it's 40 degrees Celsius in the shade. An anxious wait begins for breeder David Le Mesurier. He has spent his whole life with falcons. The birds are a part of his family and, above all, the basis of his business. It's a real dedication when you go training a falcon. If you want to go on holiday, it's not like a gun. You just put it away in the cupboard and go away on holiday. What do you do with the bird? You have to look after it. You can't just think, oh, okay, I'm going to go away to Spain for six weeks, holiday on the beach. You know, you've got to really think of these sort of things. It's a lot of dedication. It's totally, totally dedicated to the birds. Otherwise, it doesn't work. David Le Mesurier is now involved in falcon breeding in a big way. With his financier, Mohamed Hilal, he's building the Nad Al Shiba Falcon Breeding Center. Hilal has invested a million dollars here. The showpiece of the facilities is the aviary, an extra large free flight cage. Yes, we need everything ready and set up. We need to test all the cooling before we can put any birds in there, obviously. You see, there's a nest there for a pigeon, I think. Yes, there's a pigeon nest on top. She's already fledged too young. She's got two more eggs now. It's a problem to bring the disease here. Yes, we need to clear that off the top. I think once the birds are in here, I don't think the pigeons will come anymore. They'll be frightened of the pigeons, I think. Do you think it's, it's enough for the bird to fly and to... to yes, they can go, go flight here. It's really big. They can really get muscled up and get really strong when they keep going. It's 15 metres to the top here. I see. On top of the beams here, we're going to hang small plastic strips. So when the birds are flying round, they can actually see the top and they're not going to bump into any of the girders. Just two breeding falcons will fly their rounds here eventually. But there are still 12 wind machines missing, as well as two climatic chambers. There's a huge market for birds of prey in Dubai, Abu Dhabi and Al Ain. There are 16,000 falcons here, tamed, trained and pampered. And their numbers increase by the year. The falcon business has an annual turnover of $120 million in the Emirates. An Arab falcon's life also awaits Mohamed Hilal and David Le Mesurier's birds. In the city, with people. They will be driven back and forth more often than they themselves will actually fly. They'll be fed and thus won't have to fight for survival. People will teach them how to hunt. They'll be brought up by grown men. This man's still having problems with the heat here. Martin Lee comes from Canada and he's been living in Dubai on the Arabian Gulf for five years now. Car, flat, telephone, everything is paid for by his boss his sponsor, as he's referred to here. He receives no salary, just an allowance. Martin Lee breeds falcons for Sheikh Zayed. He's got a full-time job as a falcon father, and a newborn means a lot of work. The first meal is nourishing yet delicious, minced quail. These noble birds are bred on large farms. The demand for quail is enormous in Dubai. Feeding baby falcons requires patience and spit. Martin also speaks fluent falcon, which really comes in handy. Uh, well, it's just a signal for them to sit up and beg for food. And the mother does the same thing to them. But when they get a little bigger, they, then they can see well, they, they beg anyways. Well, that's all he gets for his first meal. You've got to start them off very slowly. And four hours from now, he gets a little bit more. In the nursery, right next to Martin's television, the older siblings are complaining loudly. They're famished. Okay, this is a deer peregrine hybrid. It's uh, about eight days old. And it's ready to go back with his parents maybe in two days. If you leave it any longer, he gets imprinted to me. He starts to think of me as, as his parent. And that's semi-permanent. You know, for the rest of his life, he'll think that I'm his parent. The young falcon seems to like the taste of quail. 
It's no wonder that baby falcons double their weight every four days. It's got a real appetite, this one. You don't really need to chop chop to him. Six feeding sessions in 24 hours. In six weeks, they're fully grown. Martin's young birds of various crossbreedings have all been pre-ordered. In four weeks' time, they'll be fully fledged and worth several thousand dollars. The dealers are already impatient. Look at him. What's wrong with him? I want the best care for him. You should know that we treat all birds with the same expertise and thoroughness. But for this you have to care extra. Something is going on with his feet, kind of infection. Dr. Rempel's waiting room is at its busiest. It's shortly before 2 p.m., closing time. A peregrine falcon is the center of attention. Claw problems, infected talons, ulcers, the notorious bumblefoot. A disease of modern civilization for the birds, which falcons in the wild never get. Okay, that's about as bad as it gets. Terrible foot infections. We're gonna try a surgery on this bird, but usually when they get this bad, there's very little you can do for them. Oh, many different causes of this, but sometimes puncturing the feet, sometimes bruising the feet. Um, anything that would just cause a trauma to the foot and allow a bacteria to get into it. David Rempel has treated over a thousand such cases in his career, but this one is particularly bad. Let's do this one first. It's got a scab that's gone clear through and it's made a bridge. It's so bad that it's clear through the foot. Rempel is considered a star surgeon among falcon doctors. His speciality is bumblefoot. It is almost completely uh, unique to uh, birds kept in captivity. Uh, well, we really don't know the reason for that. I don't know what to do with that. Some of these birds are discovered like this. Uh, somebody might have too many falcons or, and they discover this lately or most of the time, the, the people that train these birds, they do love the falcon, but the falcon becomes entrusted to the care of somebody who doesn't love falcons so much. In our culture, we would tend to uh, take care of these birds a little bit more personally. This is the worst stage of this disease that we can really see in a falcon. Well, I think that the foot was healed perfectly, but um, the chances of this infection coming back are 100% almost. So once the foot sustains this much damage to it and you destroy that much architecture, you know, then there's, it almost always returns. The doctor is angry. Okay. It should never have been allowed to get this bad, he grumbles. The bird should have been brought in six months ago. We'll have him on antibiotics for at least three weeks. Um, probably injections three times a day for three weeks, so he's going to have lots of attention. Care of falcons is a sensitive topic here. He can't curse too loudly. He's a foreigner and a guest in the United Arab Emirates and dependent on the favor of his sheikh. David Le Mesurier and Mohamed Hilal's falcon breeding center also requires sensitive intercultural understanding. Not just among the humans, between Arab and Britain, but above all between bird and falconer. Yeah, the grey is doing really well. He's just started molting now. As a breeder, David Le Mesurier is a substitute partner for the birds, for both males and females. That's the skill, he says. If you can't be that, then you'll fail as a breeder. The birds understand me, says Le Mesurier. They can sense love or rejection very precisely. So he's raised with people, obviously he doesn't speak English, so we have to speak falcon to them. <laughs> and the different birds have different calls. This gerfalcon has a chopping sort of call. Peregrines are slightly different, the sakers are all slightly different. We actually do physically talk to them. Uh, the chops, you, the sounds you make 
the bird actually relates to those sounds. So depending on their display, we have to talk back in the correct manner. Otherwise, the display doesn't work. So you really have to have a feel for the falcon. But there is a real feeling between the person and the bird. Despite the strong emotions, David Le Mesurier doesn't want to leave anything to chance. The bottom line is that his avian reproduction center is a high-tech breeding station. Air-conditioned breeding chambers, cameras, an alarm system, everything is brand new and there's even piped music at a low volume. Easy listening for the falcon's well-being. At the moment, it's the soundtrack from the mission. David admits, however, that it's not a question of whether the falcons really like the music or not. Changing your music CD, on all the corridors here with the falcons, we play music throughout to give a background sound in the corridor. See if we have visitors here, and they can hear that rather than people whispering in the corridor. It gives a constant sound with the falcons. David's boss, Mohamed Hilal, is already off on business again. We have to reduce the price because the people from outside, from Russia, especially from Russia, they are uh, smuggling uh, the birds from the nest. And we try to reduce the price to not let uh, these people to smuggle the bird and sell them here in the market. For example, if you buy last year one bird of 30,000 US dollar, this year you buy 25 or 20,000. A lot of birds available, white jeers, black jeers, gray, every color It's available here. No need to smuggle or to put themselves in trouble uh, from airport to airport till they bring it here. This is, you come here, you've got a paper for the bird, certificate, everything, uh, official uh, thing, and uh, we hope this one to succeed. The days when money was no object are gone, even on the Arabian Gulf. Sober calculations have replaced unrestrained waste. You breed yourself rather than buying at a high price elsewhere. On his way to the hospital, Dr. David Rempel makes a house call. Martin Lee's two oldest chicks need to be vaccinated. Germs and other dangers await them. In the falcon world, often only one chick in three survives. That's the law of nature. How you doing? Pretty good. Nice warm day again. Yeah. But breeder Martin needs to turn as many eggs as possible into fully grown birds. That's the law of economic success. Put it down on one of them. How many, how many bird, I mean, how many eggs do you have right now? Uh, I think there's about, well, about 75. Nice. Got, got yeah. nine, nine hats, about 75 under chickens with parents. Wow. Martin has to take the falcon chicks away from their mother once again, but it's only for a moment. And it's absolutely essential. So, so you think it's into the breast muscle? Let's try and do it right, right into the, um, I know when we have a sick chick, we put it into that kind of membrane on the, between the leg and the belly. Yeah. I, I forget the name of it. It would, uh, there, but, uh, actually, it would be better if we could just do it right up here, right along the, the breast there. Just a tiny, tiny poke. Right under the skin. This is a vaccination against Newcastle disease. It's a virus that affects everything. Respiration, digestion, but it mainly causes nervous signs, like, uh, Uh, loss of balance, paralysis, things like this. And falcons are just as susceptible to this as anything. Okay, little guy, that didn't even, didn't even feel that one. Okay. People are concerned with worldwide. This is the main virus disease that birds get that we're all worried about. And it's fairly common here in the UAE. The little ones look nice and healthy, praises the duck. You're doing a good job of raising them. Well done. Okay. The two men go over to Martin's air-conditioned bungalow for a morning chat. Falconers always have things to talk about. The hospital team can manage for a few hours without the boss. Right now, Majid, specialist for feather repair, is in a permanent state of stress. Yesterday, many were out hunting or training with their falcons, so there are plenty of ruffled wings today. One of Mohammed Hilal's assistants has brought this falcon with broken feathers in. OK, I'll fix this and come back at the 12 o'clock. Nowadays, no one is willing to wait for the molt when all feathers grow back. Time is money, and the falcon hospital on the outskirts of town makes anything possible. A general anaesthetic for the bird. The feather transplant can begin. We had to wait uh, two, three minutes to sleep. One, two. 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Seven and eight are still broken on. We have the feathers collection here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven at the left side. Uh, see, when they hunt with this habara, they have really tough fighting with habara. So that is how they mostly break the feather. Most of the time, that's how what they happen. Majid's feather box contains a lavish selection of feathers. So it is a really perfect color. It's no problem finding the suitable shape and pattern. Now it's just a question of manual skill. I had to do some carving of this very carefully. A routine matter for Majid. He repairs feathers like on an assembly line. The old Bedouins used to pour hot water over bent or broken feathers and bend them back into place. It didn't always work. Today's falconer wants a perfect bird. Craftsmanship with toothpicks and glue, topped off with a bit of talcum powder so that the glue and feathers don't go lumpy. The condition of David Le Mesurier's falcon is deteriorating. Dr. Rempel's suspicion has been confirmed, aspergillosis. The bird has already been in hospital for a week, pumped full of antibiotics. You see this bird's breathing hard. That's what the aspergillosis does. It hurts their lungs and their air sacs. And we're taking the blood to see how well it's responding to the medication. And the medication is kind of hard on them, so we want to make sure we're not doing any damage also. So we hope he's getting better and we're not hurting him. It seems that the tuberculosis has progressed. Lab assistant Cheryl suspects that the worst is yet to come. The CBC, the complete blood test, should bring certainty. Breeder David is worried about his sick bird, but the breeding centre is large and there's work to be done everywhere. David has a lot of falcons to take care of. His biggest hurdle is the heat. Falcons of Nordic heritage need to drink large amounts of water and they also need a constant cool breeze. That's the reason for the luxury aviary. The air-conditioned open-air cage with bathtub and wind machines has finally been completed. The afternoon trial run. It's very hot here in the summer. Uh, when the birds are flying round, they can take a sit on there and they get a strong wind blowing at them. And it's just very comfortable to sit there in the heat and hot weather. the maiden flight for the climate cage. David lets a falcon fly for the first time. Everything is monitored by four automatic cameras. Safety first, says David. After all, a falcon costs as much as a Pakistani worker in Dubai earns in a year. Because of the value of the birds here, we take security very seriously throughout the center. And these cameras monitor the perimeter of the um, large pen here, and we have a similar system throughout all our corridors and all around the outside of the centre itself, and these are tied in directly to the police. Nothing is left to chance. The only things David has no control over are fate, illness and death. He already senses that he may not see his bird in the clinic alive again. You spend it every day with them. You know, they really are one of your family. Same as if you lost a dog you'd have for 20 years or one of your family. It's very upsetting. I had a bird last year which I'd imprinted and, you know, it, it died. It was very upsetting. I've got some birds here about 14 years. A tragedy, and not just because of the money. Martin Lee remains patient. One needs to be able to wait for hours and days if babies are on the way. The chick in egg Y3 is going to hatch. With its strong beak, it's already pecked a hole in the shell. Now the breeder is a bit worried. It's all taking too long. Normally the chick should have hatched by now. 
something is wrong with Y3. Martin wants to know what's going on inside the egg. Is the heart still beating? Is the bird perhaps already too big, or is it still too small? A little bit of movement. You can see it moving up in the air, so. Uh, well, it's got a fairly big break up around the tip. Probably wants to come up fairly soon. Yeah, I can tell that he's a real big chick. He's too big to turn. The chick can hardly move anymore due to its size. It can't free itself from the shell. It could wither and die in the egg. They're going to have to move fast. Well, I'm just looking for those blood vessels. You'll see a blood vessel very soon here. But the trick is to decide whether it's an active blood vessel or not. I don't know if you can see that blood vessel there. If there's still blood flowing through it, then it means that the vein hasn't retracted into the, into the umbilical yet. And I'm breaking it out too soon. The CBC takes time. Cheryl Rempel has been sitting at the microscope for an hour and things aren't looking good. There aren't enough white blood cells. It appears that the organism has already given up the battle against the tuberculosis. This white count's really, really gone up. Yeah, I can see that. I think it'll probably be about 20, I mean 40, 45, 50,000. Mm -hmm. I can tell you as soon as I'm and done. That's in spite of everything that we're trying to do. Yeah. OK. I'll give you the rest That's of not it. surprising. The general mood in the hospital is glum. David Lemesurier's falcon is critically ill. It can't be saved. So Dr. Rempel decides on the last possible course of action, a lethal injection. It's all over in five seconds. No death throes, no more suffering. Now comes the autopsy, and the scientific curiosity is immense. It'll be weeks before we get all the laboratory results back. We'll be doing slides and pathology and histopathology and microbiology, virology, so it's two or three weeks before we get results, don't you think? Mm -hmm. this, there's a 99% chance that this bird has tuberculosis or some contagious disease, and it could, there's no treatment for that. And it also affects people, so we don't want to put our staff people. at risk. Okay, let's... Breeder Martin Lee is also fighting a battle of life and death. Can you see the big blood vessel running across there? That's one of the dangerous ones. Well, I've just got to sort of break as much away as I can without rupturing any blood vessel, and then try and decide if the blood vessel's active or not. The scary part. Martin's lucky. The chick is healthy. Now he just has to get it out of the egg unharmed. What I need to do is take a look at his yolk sac and see if it's... A tricky matter. OK, it looks like he's ready to come out, I would say. Everything turns out for the best. The chick is free and alive. A few more hours and it would have perished. Yep. I think I'm going to... I'm going to back in just for a little while. I think the timing was just right. If he left it any longer, he'd, he'd be uh, sort of dehydrated in the shell. I think good timing. Martin's done it once again, the tenth chick of the season. He brings 50 to 60 new falcon chicks into the world every year. His bungalow on the outskirts of town is a gold mine. A six-week-old bird costs $2,000 on average, Martin breeds bestsellers. Raptors that learn how to hunt from humans, birds that only fly when their owner wants them to. And when they fall ill, they're brought to the Royal Falcon Hospital. Shortly before sundown, when the heat is no longer quite so oppressive, they drive out into the desert. The local inhabitants, families, friends, business people, 
with heavy-duty jeeps and proud birds. Falcon training with state-of-the-art high-tech equipment. This is telemeter for the birds, just tracking. For example, if the birds go very far from uh, you, you can track it. Sometimes it can, it can uh, uh, go very far from you, maybe uh, very far Habar or something, uh, chase that and maybe comes behind something, behind rivers or behind m mountains or something. You have, you have to use this one for that. You see, we are using this uh, frequency, which is, for example, nine, which is this one. Today, his new falcon is going to be trained with a kite, the highest form of flying practice in the air. The kite should rise 500 meters, with the quail's wing as a lure. We use this one for the bird, just for flying, to teach the bird how to fly, how to climb from low level to high level. Because captive bird, usually, they are not flying with the mothers and their parents, actually. We, we teach them how to fly. From, from A to Z, start, starting because the, the wild bird, usually the mother and the parents, they teach them how to fly. How to climb, actually, not only to fly. Uh -huh. Because the climbing here is difficult for us, especially with the bird, uh, like the breeding farm birds. The noble form of falcon training, and a sensible one, especially if it's the first time. The bond of trust between man and bird will now be put to the test. Nothing is certain. Will the bird return to its owner? Will it climb to the level of the kite and catch the dead quail wing? Will it return to the ground safely? Anything could happen. Start to climb. Uh -huh. Against the wind, after that, he will, uh, she will change towards the... The falcon could hurt itself, could fall prey to a bigger raptor, or it could disappear forever. But Mohammed can stay calm and collected. His falcon already knows what to do and how. Mohammed has been a good teacher. I'll, I'll feed them now, start to give them food. Because this is a reward. You see, hard work and you have to give them something. Not forgetting this and continue every time when you release uh, the bird towards the sky, not forgetting. I, if you are not giving anything, the bird will not go. Why am I going there for nothing? If the bird is sick and you are not taking care and if you are uh, not giving him good food, the bird is feeling exactly what you are doing with him. Like you are doing, what, like if you have a dog. Sometimes if you are friendly with the dog, the dog will help you. Mohammed's friends have discovered a pheasant at the edge of the dune, hidden under a dry bush. The pheasant flies for its life in vain. The peregrine falcon of one of his friends is fast and well trained. Falcons hunt to the point of self-sacrifice. Every time they're in mortal danger. Sometimes they fall victim to an eagle during the fight. Such is the harsh law of nature. The pheasant ends its existence as food for a falcon. For the Arabs, the fun part of the evening can begin. Far from the day-to-day -day routine and the hectic pace of the city. Hobby and relaxation, but for men only. Did you see the way he flew after the pheasant? So fast, always on his track, zigzagging. My falcon would have done that completely differently. He would have climbed steeply and then nosedived fearlessly. That's much more spectacular. No, they really should race each other. Otherwise, it's all over much too quickly. After the hunt, it's time for a cup of Arabian tea. Strong and black, spiced with cardamom and sweet camel's milk. 
The picnic basket is never missing and the mobile phone stay switched on. And the permanent topic of the phone conversations? Falcons. Have you told him about the falcons? The guy who wanted to bring the other birds? I have an exquisite falcon. I have to tell him about the falcon. Its color is almost black. No, no, not completely black, like ashes, but a bit blacker. We have to speak softly, the others are praying. When my falcon flies westwards, it glistens, and it climbs like a bolt of lightning. Many people have made me an offer. One idiot offered me just 10,000, but let me tell you, no one is going to get even one feather from him. Not even for 70,000. This bird is priceless. Now it's become everything new and all uh, new technique with the birds and the people that are very busy with internet, very busy with the computers and these things. But still, the falcon is there and their roots. It's not, uh, not, uh, not, uh, not forgettable. The falcon is a very good friend with the Arab people. They even compare the beauty of their wives, a Bedouin can have up to four, with the grace of their falcons. Then the city calls them back to real life, to the present and the day-to-day -day routine. Business is waiting. Dubai never sleeps. Traffic pulsates until long after midnight. Shopping centers and offices remain open. Making money and spending it, that's what drives Boomtown Dubai. And when the next day breaks, they'll go out and feed their falcons again, fly them, train them, and take them for health checks to the Royal Falcon Hospital.